Thank you all for being here. I'm just going to say one sentence a minute, if that's okay. So this weekend, can you all hear me? Yes, if I speak at this volume? Okay. Um, I'd like to share a combination of some of the more advanced direct non-dual understandings. Um, but also, I think if I do just that, maybe it will be um, over some of your heads. So I'll, I'll do my best to bridge that and to give some um, introductory pointers and realizations and kind of talk to your life um, at the level that I presume it is approximately at, in terms of what your consciousness is filled with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that hopefully a lot of this will be relatable. And at some of the more advanced stuff, you will be able to simply digest intuitively. So if it, because, the more advanced, I was just thinking about this this morning, um, the more advanced it is, the more it starts to sound like gibberish. So I was just kind of contemplating how pretty much every time I teach, it's not what I'd like to teach. There's always a concession. There's always a bridging. I mean, and that's what I like to do. I, I'd like for you to get it, right, more than I'd like to hear myself speak. So I do like what I teach, but there's always a concession. There's always um, a translation that needs to happen rather than a sort of more perhaps poetic reveling in the obviousness of that which is spoken. And then the speaking is simply a, a celebratory confirmation of that which is already obvious. But the more you talk directly from that state to that state, um, it just sounds more and more incomprehensible and uh, kind of cryptic. So um, obviously the art of teaching is to, or includes at least, the element of uh, decrypting some of the mystery and giving you the tools to decrypt it yourself, to understand it to bring it into your experience, because if um, you're not taking it into your experience, then what's the point, right, of teaching and learning?
So a few topics perhaps to just kind of warm you up. Um, first of all, let's start at where everybody's at, no matter where they're at, which is I want happiness. And raise your hand if you think that that's not what you want, which is fine. <laughs> Another version of it is I want to feel good. I want to be at peace. I want to experience tranquility, serenity, joy, bliss, excitement. I mean, if there was no desire along those lines, no desire to feel better, then you probably wouldn't be here. But the thing you think you might be after in life, perhaps your desire is to accomplish certain things. I want to know how to accomplish this. I want to know how to attain that. I want to know how to manifest this or that. But all of those are just indirect routes to the same desire. Basically, you want to know what you are. You want to know and feel and experience and reside in connection with that which you are. And every person will give this a different name based on their conditioning. But it's all the same thing. Like you're all here for the same reason. So, from then, from there, something to understand or contemplate is the maturity with which you want happiness. The desire for happiness matures over time. Have you noticed? When you're a kid, it's wanting this flavor ice cream instead of that flavor ice cream and if you don't get it you'll fight really hard to get the flavor that you do want otherwise you'll roll on the floor and you cry because you're unhappy <clears throat> and then as you grow older you kind of try to cover up this desire for costless joy with responsibilities because in a universe that's unhappy, and by universe in this case, I just mean planet Earth, because right outside the atmosphere, it's incredibly joyful. It's just this atmosphere that sucks. Even though there's so much beauty here, so much perfection. So in a universe that's, that's unhappy, where everybody's unhappy, it becomes a sin to be happy. Now, we don't put it in these terms. But why are you not ridiculously happy? Or why do you tone it down when you're, say, with your family? Right? Sometimes you have moments where you're just so happy. But, you know, let's be cool. Let's be responsible. Let's not, uh, let's not be too happy. Actually, when I was in high school, we had this sort of uh, this uh, trendy thing we would say to each other. It's in Dutch. And it's uh, need to play. So we would, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or if it was just my high school. But it was a cool thing to say, like, you know, if you're not cool enough, if you're too happy or you're too excited or you give something too much significance, we would say, hey, need to play, which means not too happy, okay, not too happy. Let's not be too happy. That was like a trend for a while. Um, but it's basically that concept. 
that I'm talking about is um, like if you're unhappy, then it's almost a sin for me to be happy in front of your face, no? It's kind of rude. It's kind of rude for me to enjoy God while you're suffering about your dying grandparents or parents and whatever is happening. It's kind of rude. So let's all be a little bit more unhappy so that those that are unhappy don't feel even more unhappy. There's some weird kind of agreement like that that we have. Now, I'm not saying you should be like over the top dramatically exuberant all the time um, because that kind of becomes a show also, right? And again, within the topic of maturing your desire for happiness, um, there's also a stage where happiness becomes a, becomes an ego kind of a pat on your own back. Like, look at how happy I am or can be regardless of my circumstances. Um, which is fine if that's in the solitude of your own experience and there's a purity to that. Like, there's a joy and like a, a pleasure in a sense of reveling in the freedom that you're able to actually be happy in the midst of whatever circumstances you've got going on that typically you would call not so good. But if it becomes a show, if it becomes a identity, then again, it's time to mature a little bit at some point because then it's really not happiness. It's not as happy as it could be. So we grow up, we kind of suppress our causeless joy with responsibility towards others blending in and not being too happy, need to play. Um, we don't want to upset those that are unhappy, after all. And those that are unhappy, usually because of their facial expressions, we think they somehow know more than we do. It's also a weird subconscious thing. Because they're serious, so there's authority in that, right? And so those unhappy people must know something I don't. The inner child goes like that. Well, look at all those serious faces. I, mean, I must be serious too because they know something I don't know, right? They have an authority. They've attained something I have not attained. Which is not true necessarily, maybe some cases. But. So there's, there's all these weird little ways that we condition each other to not be happy. So be mindful of that. And then... Um, then we try to fit that happiness inside of a sort of a paradigm of achievement for a lot of people or accomplishment. Because now that we've encapsulated ourselves within a bubble of seriousness and responsibility and life is hard and life should be heavy and you should work hard, and you should fight hard, you should prove yourself. Now that we have that container, and that association with uh, only if it fits in that paradigm am I allowed to be happy? Am I allowed to feel happiness? It's only okay if it matches that sort of paradigm. So then what's the best thing available within that paradigm? It's success, typically. Some form of success. Outward success, usually. So we try to create happiness through success because success fits within the paradigm of we're not, not nobody's really happy and those that are serious, no more. And um, yeah, let's take responsibility for everything. So in that serious role, then you know you start working and you start trying to get happiness from being successful and having certain attainments that you can show to other people that you can show up with. And maybe um, you want to buy some fun toys on the side, some things you like, or some uh, nice uh, vacation spots, and stuff like that. Or a partnership is a big one, right? The joy, the happiness of someone else loving me because I forgot how to. It's a whole other topic. The non-existence of relationships. Um, but then as we mature, 
it starts to sort of get into the spiritual domain, if you want to call it that. Once an entity matures enough, and what's maturi maturing? Maturing is suffering, typically. Um, it's rare for someone to mature a lot without suffering. It's possible, but it's rare. Usually struggle, suffering, challenge is what mature says. Now, it's possible to mature without that. And I actually encourage you to use the suffering that does appear in your life in such a way that it motivates you to remind yourself to learn lessons before shit needs to hit the fan. Because the reason shit hits the fan, typically, is because it wants to point you in the right direction. It wants to reorient your focus. But if you are able to reorient your focus in the early stages, if you can start to pick up on when things go a little south, or you go a little off track, you go a little out of alignment, if you can pick up on those subtle sort of intuitive and emotional mental cues, and you remember how much it sucked to suffer last time around, then you can motivate yourself without having to wait for the next cataclysm in your circumstances to remind you to pay attention and to take the action required to shift back into alignment. Make sense? So if you train yourself to pay attention, to learn faster, to learn more efficiently, to listen, to become a better listener to the signals that we could just say comes from your higher self. Let's just say that. Uh, but you can say it in whatever way you want. But those su subtle impulses, if we can take these subtle cues and implement them, have the motivation, the discipline to implement them based on our previous experience of how much it sucked to suffer, right? Like if anything, remember, it sucks to suffer because that will motivate you to take that information and realign yourself. Because when you realign yourself, then your circumstances don't have to smack, smack you in the face as often. That's what suffering is. It's just a gentle smack in the face by your mom or dad. Up there. It's a little spanking. Pay attention. Oh, okay, okay, okay. At some point, the child remembers. It disciplines itself to learn efficiently. And it listens to those subtle impulses. And then no spanking is needed, you know. Unless you have a psychopathic parent, but the higher self is never psychopathic, so that helps. It doesn't want to spank you just for the fun of it. It doesn't have a weird sort of human distortion like that. Because when it spanks you, it spanks itself. When it hurts, it, when it hurts you, it hurts itself. So there must be a reason for kind of uh, those catalytic moments in your life where shit seems to hit the fan. There must be benevolent, loving reason behind that. And a cause, too. There's a reason behind it, which is benevolent, which is to get you back on track. There's also a cause for it, which is you, for getting off track. Right? So you cause sort of your own cataclysms. Now, in some things, you're simply not able to be aware of other than through sort of uh, challenging circumstances. But a lot of things, 80-90% of your circumstantial hardship can soften and soften and dissolve and no longer manifest if you learn how to pay attention and to learn from yourself directly. Because really, nasty circumstances is just a way for you to learn to listen to yourself. It's an indirect route of you paying attention. But because you've got your blinders on and you've got your headphones on and you're just focused on physical reality, it's the only route in which it can send you a letter. And sometimes the letter just isn't that pretty. But it's helpful. It's written with love. It's sent with love. And it's delivered exactly on time, all the time unlike here sometimes. That's just a side note, but 
um, the maturation of the search for happiness or the search for God or the search for source or the search for enlightenment or the search for well-being or the search for peace or the search for peace of mind, whatever it is, clarity, joy, happiness, bliss. <clears throat> the truth, maybe. The search for that matures over time. Through those experiences, we pay more attention, we pay more attention. And at some point we realize that getting the toys that we want doesn't really give us the happiness. And being successful doesn't really give us the happiness. Doesn't mean we should necessarily stop what we're doing or stop being successful. But it just means you see the emptiness of it. You see that it doesn't give you happiness. And it's okay if you don't see that yet. You don't have to try to force your way into seeing that. If you're really excited about the success thing or getting the toys, or the vacations, or the this or that, or the partnership. If you're really excited about that, and it seems really real to you, by all means, go explore. But you will find that over time, over time, over time, everything is beautifully hopeless. And at first there's a resistance to that. But over time there's a beauty in it. And then over even more time there's a bliss in it, there's a liberation in it. So sorry to you know, give a bit of a bad news as to where the maturation of your search for happiness is going to. But it's uh, futility is where it's headed. And that's really the peak of, of happiness, is when futility reaches its zenith. And you're closest to source. Doesn't mean you suffer. No, it's, it's bliss. Futility is bliss, if you're ready for it. But there's stages up to that point, and some of you are somewhere on one of those sort of stages. But over time, the search for happiness matures. And it's no longer even in giving things significance or, or meaning in certain ways. But for the time being, it is experienced through those windows. When you give something a positive definition, you let in some of that natural happiness. When you give something a negative definition, you prevent yourself from tapping into that happiness. Now. This is sort of a gradual explanation of things, linear. But what I want to get into with you guys is a, is a nonlinear access to happiness, to bliss, to truth, to yourself, to God. That's nonlinear. So then, if you get that, you can throw everything I just said out of the window. And you can skip all those stages. And you can apply it wherever you're at. You can apply it wherever you're at. So now some of this might sound like gibberish, but I'll try to put it in cohesive sentences. Um, and I will introduce it. And for some of you, this uh, is probably not entirely new. But still, it's the subtlety with which one can point to it that is rare, the directness with which it can be transmitted that is rare, and that most likely, even if you are aware of some of the words I'm speaking, and you kind of get what I'm saying, there is greater subtlety possible for you. There's a greater directness possible for you. There's a greater liberation, more instant liberation possible for you. So. Pay attention. Don't think too much, if at all. I know it's hard not to think for some people, but try not to overthink. Try not to process things. Just receive. Because the uniqueness about this 
particular teaching is that it cannot really be taught. It can only be, you can only be exposed to it, which is how it's unique. You can't really teach it in a typical sense. I can't really write it down on a piece of paper. You take it home and you start practicing. There's some ways to do that a little bit, which I'll also do, which has been part of my teachings already. But the actual recognition itself occurs by being exposed to a stream of consciousness, if you will, that's in alignment with that message. And once you've been introduced to it, you can reintroduce yourself over and over again. So, That's the essence of it. And it's possible for you to recognize that you are always and already free. And this gives rise to great bliss, great joy, and great peace. And over time, with practice, as you continue to recognize the fact that you're always already free, your 
mental, emotional momentum or the distortions that have generated all these hundreds of thousands of different ways in which we suffer on a day-to-day -day basis for no good reason whatsoever, I might add, that begins to come to an end. But the beauty of this recognition is that in your natural state, if you will, even before the emotions and the thoughts and the conditioning unwinds, you can recognize that great bliss, that great freedom, as already completely the case, as already entirely available. And it's instant and it's spontaneous. It is, in a sense, un unproduced. It's just here. It's just already the case. Now, the highest, if you will, understanding of this is that you just get it. Wouldn't that be nice? Where you hear this, and you get it. But you think you don't. Actually, you already get it. So, but you think you don't. So, I'll try in slightly different ways to give you access to this. Um, one is to stop thinking. If you manage to stop thinking, not enter a sleepy kind of a sedated trance state of no thought, but radically, immediately, with a freshness, stop thinking. And you recognize that clear space that remains, the clarity, that sort of indescribable, formless, yet experienced or recognized natural state of that empty I amness, that consciousness, that's more obvious to us when we don't think for a second. That's why I often say, for two to five seconds, stop thinking or relax all thoughts and recognize what remains. So it's not the same as uh, not thinking. The goal is not to not think. The goal is not to not think. The goal is happiness, joy, truth, realization, call it what you will, liberation. And in that moment, you can recognize how liberated you are how free the natural state is, you can begin to sense how none of the things that appear, none of the thoughts, the emotions, the life events, the memories, none of them have any effect on this space. And you can recognize it as already available. So actually what you're looking for is already available. What you're secretly looking for is to no longer be affected by your own shitstorm. Right? You call it you and you defend it in public, but really it's your shitstorm, and you want to be free of the shitstorm. You seek the end of the shitstorm. You seek the, the nice weather outside of your tornado of pride. And that's really the funny thing, is that we take pride in our suffering. We hold on to it, we defend it, we defend the right to. Like every time, almost every time, in mainstream anyway, that I toss a little innocent idea out there, out of love for you guys, along the lines of, you don't have to give significance to your trauma. Everyone starts debating and throwing tomatoes. It's like, you, you wanna suffer or what? Do you like this? Do you like to hurt yourself? I just say you don't have to hurt yourself. You don't have to you don't have to give so much meaning to what that person did to you. You don't have to do this or that. You don't have to give so much significance. 
You don't have to fight for equality. You don't have to be a feminist. Oh, yeah. What do you know, you white kid, white boy? Well, I know freedom from suffering. I think that's quite valuable. What do you know, feminist? I'll have my happiness over your activism any day of the week. And if you tasted what I tasted, you would choose the same thing and you would smack yourself in the face lovingly and say like, wake up. So we defend our suffering. We get rigid about it. And right now in some way, shape or form, you're rigid, you're rigid about your beliefs. You're rigid about your positioning. What do I mean by that is you position yourself somewhere in some framework of thought. You position yourself somewhere in your mind. You do this automatically. We just talked about this yesterday with a small group. I said, um, someone was sharing something in a small group and uh, I was just noticing subtle vibrations in the way that she was sharing something. Uh, and in, instead of responding, I often don't respond to what people share, but when <laughs> when they uh, when she shared this, I didn't respond to that, but I I was actually pointing out the vibration of, I asked her, uh, what did I ask her? I asked, uh, can you be aware of where you're positioning yourself right now in relationship to this group? In your mind, in your subconscious. Can you feel how you have an image of who you are in this particular dynamic with these three other people in this room. Can you notice that? And again, I'm going to go back and forth a little bit between more sort of human relatable uh, observations and then the more direct teachings. Thank you. Um, so, because any time we walk into a room, we become someone else. Like when you walk into your parents' house, you're a different person. You feel different. You either feel better or less good than you feel on your own. You feel either superior than them or inferior to them. You feel either sort of overconfident or intimidated by them. But all this, why does every room feel different to you? Not room, but the people that you're walking into. Like every room of people that you're walking into makes you feel different. Um, it's not necessarily because of their energy, although it's a contributing factor. It's not so much because of who they are, it's much more about the image that you've created about yourself in relationship to them. So you've positioned yourself somewhere in your own thinking. You've placed yourself in a position. You are now in this position every time you're with that person. That's uh, it's why at some point people just kind of have to break off relationships or whatever. Well, one reason is um, one reason is that it becomes so heavy, becomes so solidified that that's who we are, that that's where we position ourselves in relationship to this person, this friend, or partner, or or mom and dad, or um, sibling, and we don't know how we can change that. We don't have uh, conscious control over it. So the only thing we can do is change the circumstances or break off the relationship, which isn't a bad thing per se. Um, but we can actually change that if we want to. We can become aware every time we walk into a room how our energy shifts and become aware of that subtle first image that you have of yourself based on possibly what you think they think of you. Let's say you're in, let's say you're a business person or you're an aspiring business person and you walk into a room with someone who's been in the field for 30 years and has made like hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, is like a very successful business person and you're an aspiring business uh, person. You're gonna position yourself in relationship to the thoughts you have of them in a certain way. It's going to be an inferior position, most likely. In your mind, you're inferior to them 
they have something to, to give you. You have something to gain from that situation. And so you're going to place yourself in that position. And according to that position, you're going to act differently. And you're going to filter everything that is available to you in terms of intelligence and information and consciousness. And it's going to first go to this position before it comes out of your mouth. And then you go back home. And maybe you feel slightly superior than your partner just because you're smarter or you're sexier and you're kind of out of their league, but you decided to marry them anyway or whatever concepts you might have. So then you, <laughs> you go back home and you feel superior. You place yourself in a completely different position. And now everything that you channel, all the intelligence that's available to you, is it going to filter through that point of view before it comes out of your mouth? And you do this game all the time, all day long. And I said yesterday, that's why so many people identify as introverts. Nobody's an introvert. That doesn't exist. It's just that you don't know how to control this. And so you feel victim of this position that you place yourself in when you're around certain people, or around people in general, period. Now, then we went deeper, and this person asked me, well, why do we position ourselves somewhere to begin with? Why do we do that in the first place? When we walk into a room, when we meet people, why do we create such a positioning? Why not just stay like empty, locationless, spacious consciousness, bliss, already free, one with God, all that is is a manifestation of it. Why not stay like that? Why position ourselves? And then I asked, well, because, we, or I shared something along the lines of, well, there is a root positioning that you have that's not dependent on being around anyone. So, and that's the cause to begin with. That's the initial cause. So then I asked this person or someone in the group, if you're by yourself in the shower, what's your position then? There's nobody around. You're just washing yourself. Maybe you're humming a song, thinking about some things that happened that day. or You're just by yourself, but you're still positioning yourself somewhere. You still have a root position. Now, if this position is fairly positive, you're generally a fairly happy person. If this position is some type of sort of heavy victim position, you're generally a miserable person. It's really that simple. Where you position yourself, I mean, it's layered and complex and you've added thoughts to it over time, but it is essentially this simple. You have a core positioning. You have a core belief of what you are. And so everything you do, regardless of who is around, even when no one is around, you're going to filter first through that position before it comes into your awareness. That's why it's unconscious for most people. But now you have no more excuse. You can be conscious of it if you want to. And liberate yourself from it. Free yourself from this core positioning. And what is this core positioning? At the very root of it, it is, for most people, the concept that you are located somewhere. Location, period, is the root positioning. You believe it's not true. You can't find that it's true. You can't actually find evidence if you look objectively enough. But we always assume that we have a location. And that sucks. For God to suddenly have one spot, for the omnipresent, ever-present, all the infinite parallel realities appear eternally in the now within me, to like, I'm standing in the shower, and I need to wash my hair and do my makeup and get ready for this day that looks exactly like yesterday. That You know, the contrast, of course you're a little bit unhappy. Of course this is not as fun and pleasurable as the love, light, bliss of eternity. But it's an assumption, it's not true. And it's the body that conditioned this in the consciousness. So another way of saying location is body. You believe you are the body. Um, this is just something you've assumed over time because of the senses, all seemingly pointing back to your location as being at the receiving end of those senses, all coming together somewhere here, somewhere inside your brain, maybe. Or if you're spiritual, maybe you're inside your heart. 
you've decorated your prison a little bit, your prison. Um, so over time, the sensory perceptions that you have have conditioned your belief that you're located somewhere, but you can't find that that's true. And biologists and scientists and neurologists and brain surgeons, they have not been able to find that that's true either. They've not been able to find you in your brain. Oh, there he is. Look at him dancing around. Whee! This little guy inside the brain. <laughs> that's him. That's, who, that's the controller of the body. That's you. It's not true, but we believe it. And because we've come to believe it, we've come to sort of focus on the experiences that go along with that. And so now our life, life itself, God itself, consciousness itself, has filtered itself through a position of victimization, regardless of how empowered or disempowered you believe you are, how superior or inferior you believe you are, how confident or insecure you believe you are. As soon as God thinks of itself as being located somewhere, it's a victim. Why? Because if I'm over here, something else is over there. And it's only a matter of time before something else starts running into me over here. So I'm a victim of this universe because I'm over here, the universe is over there. Location is the root cause of all victim thoughts. Now it's possible, I wouldn't share this, of course, if it was just hopeless, information. Um, I share it because there is hope. You can actually begin to loosen up your identification with location. And it sounds very technical, and it is actually technical. It's, a, it's just an observation you make. It's not very dramatic. It's not very personal, ultimately. It's just kind of the way of things. It's the way that we have forgotten ourselves. So if you can become aware of the sense of location, first of all, become aware of the senses, because often consciousness is looking at the world through the position of the me as the body, the location-based sense of self, without any knowledge or awareness of that sense of self, right? We're just aware of the things, the objects that appear to us. We're interacting with this. We're not really aware of the fact that we are filtering ourselves to begin with through a position or location. So the first step is to bring awareness away from the view of the world and the senses, the objects that the senses perceive, and onto the senses themselves. So just become aware of the almost like one sense that includes all these five senses, if you will, or however many senses you think you have. kind of see that they have sort of a merging point, almost. They have a point where they seem to come together, sight, smell, touch, etc. So just be aware of the fact that you're always gathering data through the senses. And what is that? You're aware of that, but what is that but information? Isn't that just information? Isn't that just perception, appearances? It doesn't prove anything. It's just appearances, just you smell something. Colors and shapes, sensations, taste. You hear some sounds. You have some thoughts. You can kind of include the thoughts in, in this too. The mind sort of is a sense organ almost in one way. But all of that is observed. You are aware of the sensor that's doing all the senses, all the sensing. You're aware of all that information. No? But you forget that. You take what you perceive for granted and you interact with the object you perceive as if you are the senses. This is forgetfulness. This is unenlightenment. This is why you suffer. If you can remember to be aware, 
of the entrance point of where the consciousness believes itself to be the body and then accumulates all the sense data. If you can stay closer and closer to that point, if you can stay before the senses, you can begin to awaken to the fact that there is no proof that you, consciousness, are located anywhere. Just because you see a room with certain dimensions doesn't mean you're in it. When you play a video game, you also see a room or a world. Doesn't mean you're in it. But if you get lost in it, then you forget that you're holding the controller and you can walk away at any moment. And then whatever happens to the video game character, oh, you're going to internalize and have a preference about, shit, I died. Fuck, it's that same guy that shot me again. I'm going to get him back this round. You get engaged. You're just sitting on your couch. Nobody shot you. Right? And, but it's the same thing with your perception of your senses. But you get so engaged that you forget. It's forgetfulness or unenlightenment. And you need to be reminded over and over again if you want this type of freedom. And the more you want it, the more you'll imbibe it when you hear it. The more you'll let that be the truth and let that be the end of it. But the more other things you want, that's why I started off with the maturity of seeking happiness, sort of the range of it, is because the more immature you are, the more you need to hear this. But if you're really too immature, you wouldn't be here. So you're at a certain level of maturity when it comes to your relationship, to your desire for happiness or joy or freedom. The stronger that relationship is, the purer, the more understanding, comprehensive, and mature that relationship is. The more ready you are. It's like a ripening fruit. It's like the apple that's ripening, ripening. Oh, not quite yet, not quite yet. No, ripening, ripening. At some point it drops. It gets it. It wants it. It's ready. Then you only need to hear it once to gain massive integration of that truth right away but you're listening most likely you're listening to this and there's some variation some version of oh this is nice information as part of my whole life but there's also the ice cream that i want and there's also the career that i'm working on there's also this and again doesn't mean you should stop any of these because it doesn't really matter what you do when it comes to happiness it doesn't really matter what you do when it comes to true happiness Eventually, anyway. Right now, I know it doesn't appear that way. But when you're ready, it doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't really matter what happens to your happiness. Because the natural state is unaffected no matter what. And you can access this natural state. You can actually begin to feel this natural state right now. It's here before your thoughts. It's that intrinsic awareness which is already unaffected by anything you perceive. It doesn't matter how filled with content it seems to be. It doesn't matter how loud your senses are screaming at you or your own mind is screaming at you. The nature of that, the essence of that, the basis in which that arises, the basis out of which that seems to appear, is already here and it's already free. And it's already timeless. All these qualities that you hear the saints speak about, like if you meditate, you know, timelessness, bliss, unconditional love, eternity, deathlessness, immortality, those things are already innate in your being. It's already here. And it can be recognized. Your only choice is to recognize it or not recognize it. Everything else is kind of illusory. To not recognize it is unenlightenment. To recognize it is enlightenment. So, how come you're even able to hear my voice. And more precisely, how come you're even able to know that you're hearing my voice? Because the hearing of my voice could be attributed to the senses and 
a skeptic could do away with it like that. But how do you know? By what power right now do you know that you're hearing my voice? And are you in control of that power? Did you create it? Did you think it into being? Or was it always already there? And you have absolutely no control over your natural state because it's too all-encompassing. Control requires a position to control something else that you position, subject, object, relationship, duality, suffering, and all, and your life as a result. So, but underneath all that, if you will, before all that, what is naturally here? What's spontaneously here? What's primordially here? What's timelessly here? What's already here? What already knows? And have you contrived that into being? Have you created that? Or is it uncreated? And has it ever been affected? Is the power to know your trauma affected by the trauma? Is that in you which knows the trauma affected by the trauma? When the body gets scraped or bruised or cut, is the power that knows that scraped or bruised or cut? And don't listen to the mind's interpretation of what that means, because then you'll go to like, oh, that sounds boring or like a state of blankness or nothingness. No, this is life itself. This is bliss. That which is before what you think you are is joyful, naturally joyful, blissful. So there's a timeless awareness, there's a timeless aspect, not aspect, but there's a timelessness to you. It's already here. In which it's already clear that no thought or emotion has ever disturbed you. Because from this space, it's recognized, it recognizes only itself. It recognizes only that space. The thoughts and emotions need a positioning, need a describer. But if for two seconds you stop thinking and you recognize the natural space of ever-present, timeless, Immaculate, stainless freedom, which is already here before you think anything. You just recognize it. It's like recognizing space itself or recognizing an eternal background of consciousness. That which knows, that which hears my voice right now. It's here. There is something that's ingraspable. That recognizes your thoughts and emotions and all that. To snap out of the focus on thoughts and emotions and worldly events for a second is to just rest in that, recognize that natural condition, that natural state. Directly, immediately, spontaneously, as if it just happened by itself, like already here. Uncontrived. You don't have to first meditate or this. You don't have to accept anything or reject anything. This is before acceptance or rejection of any kind. This is before meditation or non-meditation. This is before enlightenment or non-enlightenment. It's already the case. You can't create it. You can't do it or undo it. When it comes to your very, very admirable attempt to unenlighten yourself, you're doomed in that approach. You're never going to be successful at being unenlightened. You're trying really hard to prove that you can run away from the natural state. But it's not working. You're still aware. You still exist. So you can see this like the sky as an analogy. And appearances being clouds. Let's just simplify life and say there's two components to life. One is awareness itself, pure awareness, which is like space, like the sky. And there is appearances or perceptions. 
that appear. Everything you've ever known that is object-based, other than yourself, has appeared at some point, no? Is there anything in your life that you're so engaged with typically, that you have so many stories about? That which you revolve your lives around typically? Even the concept of spirituality or spiritual teachings or meditation or practice this or practice that. Did that not appear at some point? Were you not there before it appeared? Were you not there perfectly just as much as you are here now before you ever heard about spirituality or meditation? You see, you're that power that recognizes you're not spiritual or not spiritual. You're not enlightened or unenlightened. You don't have to accept or reject anything to recognize the natural state. It's already free. It's already established. It's already realized. It only sees itself. Like the sky. It's not affected by the thunderstorm. It's not affected by the white, peaceful little clouds. Meaning positive thoughts and emotions. Neither. There's a stainlessness. You see, there's a freedom in the sky. The sky-like natural cognizance. This empty, vast clarity that's already here. That's the container for your thoughts and emotions. Now, the practice, if you will, is to recognize this space. Once you're introduced to this space, and I'll continue to talk some more, introduce you some more. The practice in everyday life is to switch your attention, shift your focus from describing things, defining things, to recognizing the basis of the things. Recognizing this natural state as the basis of the things. And here's where the freedom comes in. Here's where that instant resolution of thoughts and emotions comes in. Is when you recognize that the nature, the essence of the thought or emotion is already free. It's already love, it's already space, it's already unaffected. It's instant resolution, resolve of suffering. Because now you're recognizing the natural state, which is the essence of the emotion. It's the basis of it. Rather than focusing on the emotion from a position or that's then judging and describing based on past conditioning, that's not the way to go. Try to defend this lifestyle all you want, but it's going to continue to cause you suffering. And the beauty of this practice is you can do whatever you're doing. You don't have to change anything about your life. Not a thing. You just recognize the natural state, that all-encompassing space that is responsible for all things that appear. All things that appear are made of the sky. All clouds are made of sky. All clouds are due to sky because of sky. What is sky? In this case, it's you. It's that consciousness which knows that you're hearing my voice, for which you're not making any effort. You don't have to make any effort for this. It's your natural, it's your natural state. It's simply already the nature of things. You see? Awareness is timelessly free. It's timeless. It's timeless. It's uncreated. It never becomes anything. Yet everything that you can ever know is the appearance of that basis, of that space, of that essence. You've never not been enlightened. You've never not been free. Even right now, as you're having your feelings and your emotions, that does not mean you're not free. That does not mean you're not realized. You just let this settle in. If you just stop describing your experiences for a moment and recognize that even before you stopped describing, you were already free. But you stop describing to recognize that it doesn't matter whether you describe or not, you're already free. Just stop describing your experience. Don't be so obsessed. Basically, you're obsessed. You suffer because you're obsessed.
You're all obsessed. That's why you throw tomatoes when I suggest maybe you can let go of this or that attachment. It's like, no, are you crazy? I call that obsessive behavior. Most people are obsessed. That's why they suffer so much. If you just relax, <sighs> that obsession with <gasps> what's appearing next, what am I feeling now? What am I thinking now? What's this person going to say to me now? If you just relax and recognize the basis, this groundless, spacious existence that cannot be described by science, the very fact that you exist, this beingness, this consciousness, this space-like, already established, already free, perfect, nature of everything, empty bliss, empty clarity. You recognize when you stop thinking for a moment that there's a clarity that remains, no? Now you can dial into that clarity and it, it will teach you everything. That's the teacher, that's the inner teacher, is the state of clarity itself which is unobstructed at all times. You could throw as many clouds as you want into the sky it will not affect the sky. 